You're listening to TF Talk Weekly, part of the TF Talk network of podcasts and live streams where we give you the most relevant current stories in your fandom and more, all within 30 quick minutes or less. I'm your host, Mr. Starscream, and I'll be your guide to everything worth talking about that transformed since last episode. Discover more of our great shows at tftalk.net. Welcome to another special edition of TF Talk Somewhat Weekly. This episode consists of two back-to-back long-form interviews, starting with action figure customizer Air Max Animated. You may have heard a preview of this interview in our last episode, but this time we're bringing you the fully fleshed out discussion I had with this incredible artist. You don't have to be a super fan of G.I. Joe American Hero to appreciate his fully realized Transformer characters given the almost human treatment. So sit back, relax, and let the blood of Unicron wash over you as you follow me on a trip down Destron Lane. First off, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, Hi, my name is Pierre Kalanzaga. I'm a... Customizer, I guess that's how you all know me. I'm I'm uh, known as Air Max Animated Online, and I've been under that moniker since the early 2000s, maybe in the late 90s, 99, 98 ish. Cool. And I know you mostly through your very impressive GI Joe figure Transformer mashups. How did that come about? I call them the G1 Joes. They're the GI Joe Transformers mashup. And just a little bit of backstory to them. The idea for them was basically for me, what if Transformers weren't actually transforming robot vehicles, but were instead characters that existed in a universe like GI Joe. And I got the idea, honestly, I was browsing histank.com and someone had done their version of a sound wave, which was much more in keeping with the original design of the Soundwave character from the G1 Transformers. But the idea just appealed to me so much, so it it just branched out from there. And just so people get an idea of what these are, they're three and a half inch figures, as if they were G.I. Joe's carded, like official, but they have a bit of G1 Transformer artwork on them. And and a lot of the artwork is custom character art on here, correct? Do, Do you do that or do you commission that from a friend? Uh, I commissioned the artwork from a friend uh, for all the packaging. His name is Mike. He goes online by the name of 800 Pound Productions. He is maybe the the best graphic design uh, artist that I know. And his his art is obviously evident on all the packaging. And to me, uh, I'm I'm a mint in box, mint in package collector. So the packaging is part of the experience for me. So I didn't want to just make figures because I felt like that would be less cool than making an entire sort of presentation with the packaging, the front and the back, the, you know, the carded figure. The whole thing together makes it bigger than just a figure. Yeah, this is, I call this kind of a niche product for uh, collectors of all kinds. Has the reaction been greater from a G.I. Joe perspective or a Transformer perspective for these types of figures? Or do you even know? <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't know from which camp the reaction is greater because... I'm lucky enough to just have people like these. So they don't come and tell me, oh, I like G.I. Joe or I like Transformers. They just are appreciative of the piece itself. And I like to think, honestly, that sort of both fandoms exist on the same level. I mean, I know Transformers, you could argue, has been more successful commercially. G.I. Joe and Transformers, at least for me, were on par with each other back in the day. Yeah, there has always definitely been a huge crossover between the fan bases and even some of the creative and production. So that's why these really, I think, strike a chord with a lot of people. How long does it take to make a particular run of toys and about how many would you make on average for one particular figure? When I first started making these, I think the sound wave, I want to say I made either five or eight of those because I, I honestly wasn't sure what the market was. I didn't know how popular they would be, and I didn't want to sort of, you know, be out of pocket for 30 of them and then only sell three. So I've, I've been stepping those up. The most I've ever made is 10, mostly because it's a bandwidth issue. It's how much can I stand doing the same thing over and over again? How long does it take? It, it can vary. I mean, the, the guy that I'm working with, uh, Raging Spoon, his work is fantastic. He does all the molding and casting, assembles the figures in color correct molding, and I'm, I'm just doing sort of detail paints on those. And I'm at the mercy of his schedule, happily, honestly, because he does such great work that I'll wait for as long as it takes. But it can take, you know, a couple months or it could take longer if, if it's not pressing. So this is definitely a group effort from, from what I'm hearing you say. It, it is. It's always a group effort, and I'm more than happy to sort of share the glory. Like, I, I might have a neat idea, but without all of the help that I'm getting, these aren't 
nearly as good as they would be. Well, they're they're definitely impressive, and uh, I'm not a G.I. Joe fan, personally. It's just like... How dare you, sir? <laughs> I know. I, I'm just... All I like is crazy robots from outer <laughs> space, but I love these kind of cool mini mass produced I call these art house toys some people call them KOs some people call them customs to me a mini mass produced thing by like a high quality artist trying to look like a production figure I call this art house toy let's go back to the I want to talk about the production a little bit so you mentioned your casting someone's casting some parts are all of these casts from previous parts and mixed and matched or are you actually finding original vintage figures and like part swapping or is it a mix the base of all of these is the modern 20th anniversary slash modern G.I. Joe figures. And a lot of them have customized parts on them. I'm trying to think of a figure that doesn't. I don't think there is one. I think pretty much all the figures have some kind of customization on them. But I'm, I'm finding parts that, to me, whether they look directly like the original uh, G1 Transformers or they sort of just have the same aesthetic, I'm starting with that. So like on a character like Prime, the armor that I use, and I forget what G.I. Joe character it's from, it just looked like the grill and the windows of Optimus Prime, so I, I used that. It was like, you know, I had to do it. The head on that character is almost 100%. It's a helmet from one character carved out with a head from somebody else and then detailed antennas on the side. I don't think in any case it's just a straight up rehash of an existing G.I. Joe figure because that would be less interesting to me. Yeah, so it has to be, you have to put your own spin on it from a physical piece standpoint. I, I feel like I do. I mean, these are fun for me, and it would be less fun if I was just sort of taking something Hasbro did and having it made in a different color. It has to be sort of reinvented in some way. Looks like the, the cops, the Hasbro police are coming after you because this idea is so cool, they, they can't <laughs> yeah. let it exist. Can't deliver the cease and desist. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just maybe rattle off some of the characters you have done in this line? Yeah, I'm actually, I keep looking off to the side here because I have them all, all my G.I. Joe figures are hanging on the wall along with my custom, so I'm, I keep looking up at them for reference. But it started with uh, Soundwave, I did Optimus Prime, Grimlock, Nemesis Prime, Devastator, Megatron, Bumblebee, Starscream, Cliffjumper, and Prowl. Yeah, you're hit, you're hitting like all the A tier characters there. That's <laughs> it's really awesome. I can't wait to see what you come up with next. And speaking of what's next, I mean, will these continue? Can the world expect to see more of these awesome art house toys from you? I hope so. I mean, the, I am sort of at the mercy of of Raging Spoon because he doesn't only do stuff for me. He has his own interests. He's working on projects for other people, and and he's one of the very few people I know that will mold and cast and then reassemble the the parts on these guys. Because there are some parts that I don't know how they work, like the shoulder joints or the elbow joints the way they're inserted in the um, forearms or upper arms I have more ideas than I have time so I'll keep cranking them out as long as I can keep making them I'm not gonna lose interest in these I have other ideas from other universes so the next figure you'll see me drop I'm not gonna say what it is but it's a crossover from two different universes not GI Joe or Transformers oh wow that's what I wanted to get into next are the G1 Joes the only type of thing you do, or do you have a variety of other creations you've made that I may not be aware of? When I first started customizing, I was very much into the Batman animated series. All the Paul Dini designs I thought were fantastic. So I was doing that pretty much exclusively for, I want to say, almost 10 years. I, I wasn't doing carded work. I was just making customs. I did two carded figures. One was a grifter and one was a comedian, both in the animated style. And I actually gave those away because I was feeling generous, I guess. And then my interest in that sort of lapsed and, and then G.I. Joe had the resurgence around 2008. And I got back into it. That's pretty much all the customizing work I've been doing is all G.I. Joe based. The only stuff that I've been carding and selling has been the G1 Joes. So I'm, I'm sort of expanding a little bit just because I have, you know, I have a lot of ideas that I think are neat. I don't know if, you know, all you guys out there will agree with me, but that doesn't stop me from wanting to make them and see how they do. Well, that's the beauty of being a customizer or a creative person in general. You get the idea and you can just do it. Whether someone likes it or not, you know, you worry about that later. This is true. But I'm hoping spreading the word on these awesome G1 Joes brings you some more notoriety. And so where can people find you? I'm only on Facebook, which I know is a pain for some people, but that's how you can find me. I would recommend everyone checks out Air Max Animated and give them a follow because that's how you find out when the next one of these is going to come. You don't know which character it is every time, but it's pretty exciting when it happens. And these sell out how quick every every time. It's usually within the day. Don't be snoozing. I really thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I love your work and uh, can't wait to expand my G1 Joe collection as time goes on. 
Awesome. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I, I appreciate your interest in this. I, it was cool to be on this. Thank you. I want to thank Air Max for taking the time to discuss his creations with me and get a little insight into his process and what inspires him to put his blood, sweat, and energon into such a time-consuming product. I like to think if it ain't difficult, it ain't worth doing. Maybe that can be my back-of-box quote. Anyway, these creations are better seen with the naked eye than imagined from the open ear, so follow Air Max Animated on Facebook to see his work for yourself. You won't regret it. I'd like to take this moment to remind you about the typical weekly schedule for the TF Talk Network. Coming up next in the feed is an all-new episode of Cut the Tape with Rick Alvarez. This week, mint and sealed box collectors will cover their eyes in horror as Rick opens up his Robots in Disguise, Optimus Prime, and Siege Ratchet. Watch the horror unfold Friday on the TFYLP YouTube page. Our flagship ensemble podcast, TFYLP, will be streaming live on Sundays at noon Eastern on the TF Talk Facebook page and TFYLP YouTube. Our topic this week is what it's like to be a Transformers collector maximalist. If you'd like to weigh in on this somewhat controversial subject, you can interact with the cast in real time by leaving a comment on the live stream this Sunday. And don't forget Microcasters Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern when Anna, Christian, and Lucas berate each other over what it means to actually like Transformers. I heard a rumor that on the next show, they're going to review something that doesn't even transform. Gasp! The horror! Oh, and if you needed a reason to feel better about your spending habits, tune in live at 9 p.m. Eastern on the TFYLP YouTube page to see Rob and our rotating cast file police reports about the online and offline vendors that stole their money in exchange for little plastic men. The show is called Ouch My Wallet, but it doesn't hurt to watch the pain of others. At least it's not supposed to. And you can expect to hear more from the mysterious Mr. Starscream on whichever day I please. Just because one has supersonic flight capabilities doesn't mean they can edit any faster than a normal human germ. TF Talk Weekly comes out as often as possible, but sometimes everyone gets a case of the Mondays, and we fudge the schedule a bit. TF Talk Weekly does its best to start your week off right, but don't tell my boss if I miss a deadline or two. And speaking of Megatron, it's time to introduce our next guest to the show. There are always a few interesting characters lurking around in the shadows at conventions like TFCon, but once in a blue moon, there is a persona that is just too enigmatic to remain obscured. I heard colorful stories about a group of attendees that were following in tow of their larger-than-life leader. After investigating a bit, I knew I'd have to get the scoop from the horse's mouth himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I present the head honcho, leader of the self-designated Decepticon Empire of the Net, The one and only Lord Megatron. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on the show. My name is Scott, but uh, my online username is Lord Megatron 7. Most people know me from Xbox, and then I moved into Discord and now the Transformers Amino. Uh, All three things of these I have ownership of currently. I'm also working on several projects for the community. My objective is to make these projects fun and free and community driven. Oh, so you said Amino. That's correct. Now, that's interesting because I don't think a lot of people know what that is, but I do. So maybe explain what that particular channel, what, what are you doing with that? So if I were to explain the Amino, the Amino is uh, mostly geared towards role play as far as I've seen uh, for other Aminos, not just including my own. So um, we have these different role play chats. We have non role play. And I think it's really also geared towards artists as well. But um, we have a overall theme for the Amino, which is simply Transformers. And that has surprisingly got us to 15,000 people. So there's 15,000 people on the Amino. We are currently trying to raise up activity throughout the board by building that positivity and fun place where people can come and role play, chat, share art in a little bit of a less stress-free environment. And we actually geared the Amino towards children and adults as well, as long as they're within Amino's age limit. So we do not allow cursing. We do allow people to use profanities used by Transformers, though, such as like the silly uh, stuff they say in the shows. 
like maybe slag or something like that. Yes, yes, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I I have experienced the Transformers Amino in a very kind of like experimental sense, but I have found it is like, just like you said, is very geared towards role play, which if I have to reach way back into my youth, I sort of get that <laughs> because I was really into games like Final Fantasy and I never did D&D, but I did a little bit of that. It was a little confusing to me as, you know, as an adult. Um, as I've checked it out, I've definitely seen how, you know, it's, it's something fun for um, young people that have a lot of time and creativity that don't really know where to express that. This is kind of a place where they can they can take advantage of both of those two assets. Yes, exactly. The Amino, uh, I feel, simply has that funnel for creativity that we don't really get to see kind of in more of the adult communities, only because I, I, don't, I don't normally role play on the Amino myself. I am more of the uh, manager, admin, and owner. So we try to make sure that the role plays are all within the guidelines, which is hard enough with 15,000 uh, younger members for the most part. I would say our members are between 13 and 19, and most of them are fans of even robots in disguise and rescue bots, and it's surprising to hear the different aspects of the fandom that you don't really hear some of the older fans talk about and see how it's impacted people, you know, just like how Beast Wars may have impacted me and Armada may have impacted me, but it was not uh, popular with the adults uh, who grew up with G1. So uh, I am not a huge fan of Robots in Disguise, the newest one with Bumblebee. I've watched the whole thing, but uh, they really like it in the Amino and they talk about it a lot. A majority of my experience in the fandom is with the toys and collecting and all of the hoopla around that. But there's so much more to the fandom that you miss if that's the only thing you're, you're thinking about uh, or, or the only thing you're paying attention to. So I think it's, it's interesting to step back from that and see see how many different other places you can you can interact with the brand and like like how many jumping on points there are. For instance, I interviewed Diamond Bolt the other day. He's a YouTuber, and he's not a G1-er. He is definitely, like, Armada Trilogy was, like, his f a original jumping on point. And, like, his experience is so different. And I find it so fascinating to hear about other people's experiences that are so different than mine. And so it seems like you are very... Being involved in these different platforms that are not just crusty old message boards, you're kind of seeing a lot of that that other people are not seeing. Yeah, that is correct. I'm seeing a side of the Transformers community that I was worried did not exist. I was worried young people were not getting too engaged with Transformers, especially in the last five years. But then when I realized that when I took the lenses off that I had, where I looked at the franchise, I think these young kids are finding that not only is there a lot to love about the past, but that it's okay to love the current stuff as well. And that is part of the objective I talked to you about at TFCon was promoting that positivity where it is okay to love G1 and only G1, but it is also okay to love Rescue Bots, which uh, is a show I actually surprisingly enjoyed. Out of all of the newest content they've made, Rescue Bots, and I'm a huge Decepticon fan and it had almost none. I think that was one of the better shows that the writers actually put some thought into. I did like uh, the fact that Starscream showed up and had a good uh, yes. arc in that show. You know, it was it was cool. And and I have only experienced Rescue Bots from the... I saw the first episode. I think it's cool. It's just not for me. But I think some of the characters that they've come up with in that show will persist into the future, which is always great to see. You know, so we met at TFCon, as you mentioned, and you mentioned kind of a kind of a goal, like the goal of spreading the positivity of the brand. You came on my radar at the show because probably more for the interesting persona around you being there which i would like you to explain versus myself because i heard there's a guy named lord megatron with some minions running around that are helping him out and i was like what is this and it kind of spread around and i just think it's time for you to explain that i think it's absolutely time that i explain my cult i mean a group uh, <laughs> for the first time here um 
Yeah, my uh, lawyer always says not to to use that phrasing. Uh, But jokes aside, uh, I created this group when I was 13 years old and now I'm 27. So there are some people who have uh, very strong feelings about this group. And this was one of the largest meetups we've ever done. The most was, um, I think, 10 or 12 in the past. But this time it was... uh, 17, 18, 19, 20, and we kept pulling new people in or finding people that we had known, right, but did not know that they were going to be there. As the posse kind of grew, we took group photos, we went out to dinner, we did several uh, room parties as well. So it was uh, a very nice experience for everybody to kind of meet in person. And we intend to do it again in Orlando, but This kind of took place over four different hotel rooms that we had, and it was just a pretty large endeavor for us, and including the panel as well, because we had been working on that world for close to eight years. Yeah, so so you did have a panel at TFCon. It was on Sunday. What was the content about? How did the panel materialize? Did TFCon ask you to do this? What's the story on that? So, well, the way the panel came about was kind of interesting. We were trying to get to the point where we could get the modifications we had created to the game alive. And the game is Minecraft, correct? Minecraft is the game, and we're playing it on the Java edition, which is pretty relevant. And to access that, you also have to download this Technic launcher and uh, put the mods in for the Transformers mod. And what we had uh, accomplished here was we could now transform in Minecraft, but we also had a map capable of, you know, being whatever, a filming zone for YouTubers, a PvP open world, a roleplay arena. And we had already added a lot of amazing things like the Nemesis, the Ark, and we were ready to make this live playable for as many people as possible. So I reached out, I shot over the message and uh, the TFCon staff was very nice and gave me all the info and I shot over my presentation and they approved it. So we were all very excited to have that happen and I'm actually really surprised uh, at the turnout. I'd say there was probably um, 85, maybe even 100 at one point people who came in and out during my hour long presentation there. How was it received? Did you you get feedback from the crowd? that was there. Yeah, that was actually the best part was we got several rounds of applause. We had a lot of good questions. We had people volunteering to help, volunteering to make new Transformers models. And they asked some really interesting questions that were, can triple changers be added? And I said, uh, I think so. I'm sure the guy who created the mod is cursing my name as we speak, but uh, I think it's uh, a simple set of having another model and an alternate key to switch to. They're like, well, what about six shot? And I'm like, the sky's the limit. Let's play as R.I.D. Megatron uh, from the old show and fly around as a hand. And uh, the audience thought that was pretty funny. So if if someone wants to see this Minecraft, you know, I'll call it an add-on. I'm not sure what the exact terminology would be. Um, you can c- correct me if, if you'd like. What's the site or the link that they can go check out what you were talking about? So uh, it's a kind of a step-by-step process. They would have to download the Technic launcher, have a Java account, and then type in tf-mc.net instead of an IP address because I paid for a domain to make it easier so no one has to memorize any IPs. And that will load you into our world with the uh, modifications. So uh, what you were referring to is called a mod pack. And that is what the Technic Launcher helps you launch and makes it simpler for the game to handle process and just move about and do its thing. So do you have numbers on like how many people are in this mod pack or are accessing it? Yeah, yeah. Currently, I think it said it had 175 downloads or something. We actually had it pre-released to test on other worlds as well. But uh, the actual Minecraft world itself that it is made for now is my original creation which I actually tried to make a Jurassic Park world only to realize there's no dinosaurs. So it was pretty boring to uh, build the, you know, the park. And I was like, that's it. It's a Transformers world. I started building Iacon. And then I said, that's it. We got to build Kaon across the way. So 
that's how the whole process began like seven eight years ago it sounds pretty pretty impressive i mean as as a non-minecraft player i'm just a little too old to have really dug into that but i've seen a lot of crazy videos and stuff i would love to see um some maybe you know screen captures of of what you're talking about are there any available now that i that i could check out yes uh currently we have a youtube channel called the decepticon empire which covers all of my projects that's what i call my overall organization that manages these resources so uh, if you go to the decepticon empire there will be a video that tells you how to download and you know install everything so basically this is a minecraft world that's just chock full of transformer stuff that is right it's something you can just jump right into if you can, if you go through all the uh steps you can just like live in that minecraft world that feels like it's i don't want to say it's cybertron but it's it's got a lot of stuff that you will recognize from various continuities and it's all fan made that's right it's all fan made and it's all stuff that you should be able to recognize like uh, galvatron ship the revenge some of this stuff we actually built the framework for and then built the insides so that they can be customized by the players. So for example, if you ever wondered what was in Galvatron's cargo hold, if you want that to be, you know, a few hundred cases of watermelons, right? And uh, with the star saber everywhere, you could do that and then have that be your, your little group staging grounds for when you battle the Autobots. Very cool. And we always battle the Autobots because we don't like those. Of course not. So yeah, you you, know, you got a lot of things going on, and you, you blanket them all under something called the Decepticon Empire. So where did that come from, and why are you finally the real Lord Megatron? Because I'm sure there's been lots of, you know, imposters before now. I am absolutely the real Lord Megatron, and the reason why is I have put a lot of time and dedication into this. So when I was thinking of our name, originally when I first started it, it was the Decepticons, but I realized that that, even as a fictional movement, was a lot more than was ever really touched upon in different uh, medias, right? And uh, more than a lot of the fans got to experience in stuff like the Bayverse and previous cartoons after. So to me, being a Decepticon was something that I was very proud of. And um, I took a lot of inspiration from ancient Rome where they happened to acquire different areas and different provinces and those became part of their empire and they had their own unique culture enhanced by the presence of this imperial force. So we wanted to bring that same kind of order and respect and honor to the different parts of the Transformers community. And ironically, a lot of people say that I'm shattered glass Megatron. But uh, the reason why they say that is because I am very nice unless, right, somebody has just carried on for too long and I'm like, you are done. That's when the uh, inner Megatron comes out. And especially at conventions that, that can happen because everyone gets so excited to talk to everybody and they just don't really know when the conversation has changed. <laughs> it's actually interesting you say that uh, only because I take mentoring people very seriously. So some of the young people I found, like me and you are older, and um, I think that it's part of, you know, Transformers culture where, you know, maybe if you have kids, you teach them about Transformers. But uh, for me, I do not have kids. And these young people have come to me and I've mentored them both in the franchise, but also in kind of how, how to find that belief in themselves only because I feel that uh, that was something that Transformers helped teach me as a kid, right? There was that, you know, the strong Optimus Prime and Megatron was strong in his own way. And I think that a lot of kids now are not experiencing or getting that reinforcement that they need. So I try to teach them, listen, it's okay to make a mistake, but try not to make that mistake again. And, you know, be proud of who you are and Try to be just the best version of you you can be. Don't let anybody try to force you to be someone else. So even though your persona is Lord Megatron, you are almost instilling some Optimus Prime style guidance to some some young ones. I think that uh, Megatron in his own way had some, you know, similar ideals to Optimus and the whole story of extremism is so uh, clear to me is that uh, the Megatron you see on screen is what any of us can become if we stop, 
you know, being ourselves and allow ourselves to be pushed into the darker side of our own human nature. So I take those lessons pretty seriously and I try to instill them like, yes, you can be a jerk on the Internet because it's easy. Right. But it's better to not be a jerk only because you will be happier and so will the people around you. So there's just no um, reason to drag that kind of stuff out. This was the first big convention that you had been to, is that correct? So I actually, the first big convention was TFCon, the last one where David Kay appeared, but I had gone with my girlfriend, so I hadn't met up with anybody. And I didn't really think about it, only because I didn't know what to expect from TFCon. And I had not gone to 2016's BotCon or any of the previous ones before that either. That's too bad because uh, that's the whole party that you missed <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I, I know. I was disappointed every year. I, I was like, oh man, that looked like so much fun. The guys that came with you that are from, I believe, your Discord server and the Minecraft project, um, was it their first time too? A lot of them, it was their first time, especially the younger ones, the ones who were in the you know 19 to 23 year old range. I think for them, this was a newer experience and uh, somewhat of a almost like rite of passage as their adult freedom because they had worked and saved up and a lot of them had put a lot of effort in getting themselves from, um, you know, wherever they were to this convention. I would consider it kind of like a field trip for some of these guys, not all of them, because they they, they were younger. Yes, yes, they were. But um, it was cool to see some young blood at the show that was like into it. Like th those guys were into everything that was going on, as far as I could tell, and um, I didn't go to any anything like this. I'm not even sure things like this existed when I was that young, but um, I didn't go to one of these conventions until 2003. Was that the first BotCon? No, not even close. <laughs> it was like a decade or so past. But um, I guess I just I guess the reason I'm bringing it up is because I'm interested in their. Any of anything you noticed them talk about after it was over, like like what was their favorite part? As as someone that's not there, that's been there a bunch of times and is used to it, what stood out? Like what did you hear from your friends that you maybe weren't expecting? A lot of the feedback I got that I wasn't expecting was um, some of the connections that they made while there. A lot of them felt that they had some form of social anxiety or something like that. And they found out when put in these situations, they found they could be comfortable and they really enjoyed going to the different rooms, speaking to people about a common topic. And I think it kind of is a testament to uh, the power of the internet, right? On the internet, you meet people who have your interest Right. And then when you get to meet them in person, you find out that those 20 people you thought you had is really like a 2000 person convention or more. Right. And that was uh, the thing that I think they took away the most was they found a little bit more of themselves in some of the people there and got to, you know, meet older fans and learn things about the franchise. So that was some of the things that I think they took away as well was just, yes, there are people who love the art. Yes, there are people who love the music. And it just carried on into all the different aspects of the fandom. So there was something for all of these young people. And one of them that I was there with was actually, and is actually trying to become a composer. So he got to speak with Vince and it was really nice to hear his feedback as well. well that's that's pretty cool. I love anyone that, that's into Vince. Yes, Vince <laughs> is great. With um, branding yourself as Lord Megatron and working on all these projects, you know, obviously you have an affinity to the bad guys, even though I don't, you don't seem like a bad guy. How has that manifested beyond some of these projects? Like, how has that affected your collecting? You are a collector, I know that. What is your um, collecting focus? So if I was to talk about my collecting focus and my uh, draw towards the darker side of Transformers. My collection originally started as Hasbro official figures only, no third party, um, anything goes. So I would buy Transformers napkins, stuff like that. I have Transformers, just uh, USB drives, lollipops, soda cans, anything that they printed Megatron's image on and had official permission. Now my uh, taste has evolved 
to where I really like prototypes and pre-productions. I also do really like third parties now. And I collect um, the last three lines I really liked because they returned to a kind of G1 aesthetic. The Titans Returns, Power of the Primes, Combiner Wars. And I know there was some critiques of those lines, but for me it was fun to see those those squares and box shapes kind of come back after the you know long run of Bayverse. And uh, it ran kind of alongside, but it was nice to see that return to form. Well, so you mentioned the na- like things like napkins and whatever, but you don't just get anything that has a Transformers image on a napkin, right? I mean, it has to be something specific. Your collector focus is about Megatron. Like, how extensive is it and... How do you think yours is unique to other people's that might be trying to do the same thing? Well, I feel I am the Megatron collector, my friend, and I tried to collect everything that comes out of Hasbro. And now I'm looking at things like third parties, prototypes. And when I look at my collection and what makes it unique is I try to um, add on to it, right? If Megatron was searching for the Minicons, I will buy every Minicon so that he accomplished his goal. And um, and I will put them by him or I'll get all the prime cores, all the little primes, and I'll put them by him too. And uh, I bought the Throne of the Primes just so that I could give Megatron the throne, even though he apparently can't sit in it, which was disappointing to me. You need a Throne of the Trons is what I think you're really looking for. You know, they actually have made some impressive third party thrones that I've been looking at. Any uh, particular pieces you would say are, are notable of your collection? If someone had to ask what is what's the top five, what would you say? I think the most noticeable top five, like if you were to walk into this room, would be the Lucky Draw Armada Megatron in a beautiful lime yellow and uh, green color scheme. It's uh, not something you would expect to look really good, but it does really pull together well. And it has a matching unreleased figure from Energon that I also have behind it. So they look very cool uh, placed together. Additionally, I think that they had a unreleased FOC Beast Wars Megatron prototype that I was able to get a hold of. And uh, when you walk in the room, I feel like it's positioned in such a way that it draws your eye. It's got a gold hue to it. Not too unlike a lucky draw, but... Well, so hold on a second, because when you say FOC Megatron, I think of the amazing design from High Moon Studios in the second game, but I don't think that's what you mean. No, uh, you're right. This figure shares Grimlock's body, but has a Beast Wars Megatron custom head. And I thought that was really cool. It kind of reminds me of the BotCon Darkseid Megatron, just in its boxiness and kind of more G1 aesthetic. Yeah, that's one of those figures that uh, was kind of a mystery and still is because that head sculpt has never been released. A very, a very impressive pickup, I must say. But that is not the Megatron I think you are. When you say you're Lord Megatron, I think G1 Megatron and Beast Wars Megatron is another guy. Yes. So how does he fit in your collection? I was just about to say that I actually want to say that part of my collection that makes it unique is that I will collect any character that has shared the same body as Megatron. So, for example, uh, Tankor was once inhabited briefly by Megatron Spark. So I have a few of the Tankor figures and I have an entire shelf of just figures that are repaints or characters based off of Megatron. For example, there was Megaplex, you know, the BotCon exclusive. It is not actually Megatron, but it is inspired by him. So I uh, consider that part of the collection. Yeah, absolutely. Megaplex, I mean, he's essentially Megatron's clone. So, you you know, you you probably got to include him no matter what. Is there anything that you're missing? Like what's on your horizon for your collection that is just like, you're just waiting for the day when it shows up on eBay and you're going to get it no matter what, like something like that. So uh, unfortunately, that item that I'm waiting for to show up on eBay that I'm going to get no matter what, is the last of the Prime One Studio figures. I bought the last night two years ago and it still hasn't arrived. They just haven't shipped it yet. Once that comes, that's when um, I will pull the trigger on uh, buying the rest of them, only because I want to see what one of them looks like in person first. And since I already paid for one, I've been waiting two years. And after that, I'm going to put a 
you know, pedestals in the room to place the figures on. Wow. I mean, all I can tell you about those things from what I've seen is that they are very big. They are bigger than you think. They're like the size of a vacuum cleaner. So <laughs> be amazed when it does arrive. And it does sound fun to to get a hold of. So you've talked about the Amino, you've talked about, you know, your Minecraft server, but I believe there is another channel which is kind of the Decepticon Empire's day-to-day -day operations, if I if I may imply that. What would you like to say about that? So the Decepticon Empire's home base really is the Transformers Universal Discord. And what we do is we use that to center as a hub for all the projects, including the Amino. Discord happens to be a very stable app and has a active and growing community with the support it needs, I feel, as an application to maybe outlive things like Amino or some of the traditional Transformers websites. What's nice about it is it gives you a lot of control over how you keep your community safe. And I think that's a critical thing with, you know, any online operation. So for those that don't know, Discord is a chat program. Yeah, they uh, their slogan is a chat for gamers. Right. And since you have a mod pack with Minecraft, you know, it just sort of makes sense that you would have your own dedicated Discord server. I am more familiar with Slack myself. I don't know if that's something you're familiar with, but um, what, are, what would be the benefits of being in the Discord channel versus, say, a Facebook page or a Slack channel or just even on Twitter from a community standpoint, perhaps? Yeah, I think from a community standpoint, one of the best parts of Discord is simply their control mechanisms that they have. You can actually put in bots to impersonate characters like Optimus and Megatron. That's uh, something that another server has. There are some uh, like mini games that can actually be built in to the uh, channels where you can go in and if you wanted to make your own Transformers RPG and have people be able to go in there and interact. So the level of customization and control is is actually really out there. And there's a lot of like custom emotes you can make. And I feel that uh, it also gives you the power to limit what's happening. So while many platforms allow for customization, right? They don't really uh, offer much in the way of protection of, you know, getting raided, getting attacked by, um, you know, negative users. And Discord gives you that freedom to, you know, control the different security levels and set it up your own way to create security members to keep your members safe. I'm sure that a lot of listeners will hear some of this and be like, what? <laughs> but but there, there's hopefully going to be a few that that are familiar with this and you know i think i think it's 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 cool that there that there's someone trying to grow you know a different kind of transformers media system that you know this is why i wanted to discuss or have you on the podcast and talk about these kind of things i like to promote things that not everyone knows about not the same old like oh there's a facebook group that you should join you know like that's you know anyone anyone can make one of those it seems like you're definitely putting some time and effort into this stuff and i think it should be recognized so thank you for doing something different and you know just i think like you said trying to spread some positivity because if you've been on the simple facebook groups for transformers of which there are thousands the negativity tends to be the more prevalent notion, whether it's about the fandom or the toys or the price of things or the story they don't like. That gets kind of old and it turns people off. So it's nice to know that someone is trying to fight the good fight. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I've been fighting this good fight for uh, just about 13 years now when I started this thing on Xbox. And I had no idea we would end up taking over this many resources. And I think that when you go into something with uh, positive intent, you get what you put in back. And uh, that's why so many people came to meet me at that uh, convention, as you saw. You've been recognized by TFCon. You've been at a major convention for this Minecraft project. What is next on the horizon for the Decepticon Empire? and Lord Megatron. Uh, so what's next for the Decepticon Empire is our YouTube channel. We really wanna grow a user base 
where we can promote content from a Decepticon point of view, not just the evil Bayverse. We won't just growl on the whole YouTube channel, but we want to be able to uh, give that perspective of, you know, was Megatron right? Maybe not in this series, but compared to this one, he was. I think there's a lot of love for Autobots, which is great. And they are a crucial part of the story that brings a positive message. But I think there's something to be said about the Decepticons and how, uh, just for example, I'll use Armada. Most of the Decepticons at the end of Armada had a much different outcome than you would expect from the start of the show. And I think that as a story, right, a lot of stories are not picking up on these positive themes where they explain that a good person can do bad things and realize that, you know, okay, maybe uh, maybe I made a mistake here and that there is a chance for redemption. So I'm hoping that my YouTube channel will help bring that positivity to people who are struggling and say, hey, you know, maybe I'm a Decepticon or maybe I'm somebody who's struggling who isn't a bad person, but I have made some mistakes. So I think that analyzing the different content from the Decepticon point of view uh, would be a fun project and something that I think uh, has not been done yet, at least to a great extent. Do you have anything to say to anyone that like did not understand your persona at TFCon that might have like witnessed it? You know, that was like, what is going on here? Like, who are these people? What's happening? What, what would you say to them to be like, hey, this is what we were doing. This is why we were here. Uh, yes. Yeah, so to all of those who uh, may have been concerned or otherwise, no, we are not a cult. We have been together, some of us, for 10 plus years. So like, you'll hear us kind of rough around and joke and um, sometimes act a fool, sometimes uh, concern the hotel staff. Like when we were taking our giant group picture, I said, uh, why, why don't we lift this bench in the air? Is that OK with you? And I asked the staff and they said, just don't break anything. Yeah, my message to everybody would be um, we are all part of the same community and it's great to see, uh, you know, everybody's reaction to us. Most people reacted really positively. That was great. I think it was overwhelming for some, though, when I approached only because I had so many people with me. That's why uh, later in the con, we kind of, you know, split up a bit just so that it wasn't like, hey, uh, are you interested in Transformers Universal? And then like eight other heads appeared behind me and they're like, well, uh, I guess I have to be now. Yeah, well, it was definitely something different. People noticed and they were interested. You know, they were like, this, there's something going on here. And I'm glad I got to hear it from the horse's mouth. And I appreciate your time coming on to TF Talk Weekly. So I hope you are able to continue what you're doing and keep spreading that message of positivity, whether it's about Transformers or you know anything else. Yeah, thank you. And it was great to meet you. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing you uh, at the next convention. But uh, certainly, if you're ever in the area, let us know. Wow, that was a long interview. Who knew that Decepticons could be so industrious? Just to recap, in order to follow Lord Megatron and all his various projects, look for the Decepticon Empire YouTube channel, follow Transformers TDE on Twitter, on Amino, simply search Transformers, and to join the Discord, look for Transformers Universal. That's a lot of stuff, but it ain't easy running an entire empire. Speaking of that, I'm going to have to figure out a way to infiltrate and take command myself. Oh, is this thing still on? The TF Talk Network exists from the efforts of an enthusiastic collection of Transformers fans all across North America and beyond. The concept was created by Duran Land, and the main show, TFYLP, has continued for over 10 years due to his diligence and care. The cast at the TF Talk Network is always growing, so if you have a desire to participate, reach out to us via any of our social platforms or even email us at podcast at tfylp.com. You can directly support the podcast and keep us on the air by becoming a monetary supporter of TFYLP on Patreon. Donations to Patreon are used to cover expenses incurred by running the shows and are not distributed to individual staff members. So people keep telling me they don't like the music bed, which I say, pound sand and jump off a bridge. But if you don't like it, give me some feedback. Email me at podcast at tfylp.com and maybe I'll read your thing on the air. I'll even send you something for free if the subject line of your email is the anime all this music is from. Ha <laughs> ha.